vapor compression refrigeration. So this is what our fridge uses, this is what our air conditioner uses, this is what a heat pump for a um, hot water system uses, if it's a heat pump, hot water system. And so, and it, it can also be called a reverse Rankine cycle as well. So that's kind of nice. So we've done Rankine cycle, now let's reverse the flow and see what happens. Uh, one of the questions during the break was about the throttling valve. You can see we've got a throttling valve here in our cycle, which we haven't used before, so we can explain a little bit more about the implications of that. Uh, so basically we, we reverse the flow, we don't use water anymore, we're going to introduce refrigerants and we'll just kind of go through the process in words and the TS chart and so forth, which is what we've done for the other cycles. Hopefully it feels like it's um, logical and consistent and comprehensible. As always, questions are, are welcomed. So if a refrigerator uses a refrigerant as a working fluid, so we need to know a little bit of something about refrigerants now, we're not talking about water anymore. As a working fluid, it operates on an ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle between two pressures. And the pressures are weird and that's to avoid interpolation because um, it's slower. Mass flow rate of the refrigerant is given, determine the rate of the heat removal from the refrigerated space, power input to the compressor. So this is, your question is, how much heat am I drawing out of my fridge? Um, that sounds important to know. Power input to the compressor. What will I draw from the electricity grid to run my fridge? That sounds important to know. Uh, how much heat am I putting then into the environment? We'll talk about that. And then the coefficient of performance of the refrigerator. So these are some things that we might want to know. If we thought we didn't have enough data before, it seems like two pressures, is that enough to define a cycle? We'll find that it is. Uh, and it's wrapped up in what we consider to be ideal, the ideal assumptions that we make. So, for a heat engine, which is what we've done until now, we exploited a heat difference and the natural tendency of uh, energy to want to flow from the hot place to the cold place. And we inserted a device between that and said, well, as the heat flows from the hot place to the cold place, let's get some work out of it as well. Okay, so that was our heat engine uh, principle. We took heat in at a high temperature, we rejected heat at a low temperature. A refrigerator or heat pump, and from a thermodynamic sense, they're the same. From a purpose sense, they're different. A refrigerator, you're trying to draw heat out of a cold space. A heat pump, you're trying to put heat into a hot space. Right? So now we're using work to force heat against its natural flow. So you can see we've got a low temperature reservoir and we've got heat coming out of the low temperature reservoir into our heat pump and then pushing up into the high temperature reservoir. So we're, exploit we're using heat to reverse what um, nature naturally wants to do. Heat in a low temp, heat out at a high temperature. I've got a note here, the note is to me, construct a fridge. So let's do that. I thought I'd just do it diagrammatically rather than actually constructing a fridge. We'll see what we do. Um, I was with my, my boss at a recruitment event and I told someone I was teaching thermodynamics and they said, what's that all about? And I'm like, well, you know, like refrigeration. And they said, oh yeah, how does a refrigerator make things cold? And I said, well, you know how you compress gas and it gets hot? And my boss said, well, you need to run a fan over a cold pipe. I'm like, darn it, when you're recruiting high school students, run a, run a fan over a cold pipe. All right, he of course didn't know that when you compress gas it gets hot. You guys do because you've now done an experiment on it and everything, so you're all over that. I'll, uh, let's draw a fridge. So, with, uh, with intellectual respect and credit to Garth Pierce, let's run a fan and blow air across a cold pipe. So I've got a squiggly pipe that's, that's rejecting heat. Um, no, the pipe is cold, so it's actually absorbing heat, but that's okay. That works until the pipe is no longer cold. So we need some flow through our pipe of cold water. Well, let's take from the top of that. Right, so let's take, what do we do with our fluid after it's, after it's hot? It's boiled, actually. So in this process, it was a liquid, 
and it's boiled. Okay? We're going to take that out and we're going to compress it. So we're going to take the boiled liquid and we're going to compress it. So for that we need work in through the compressor. And now it's even hotter and also higher pressure. And it's hotter than if we draw our fridge boundary. So this is our box that our cold food is stored in. Right? And it's hotter than the outside environment. So it's going to lose heat flow into the outside environment. And indeed, with this fan running, it's going to draw heat in from inside the refrigerator. And now, you're going to draw out enough heat so that in this point here, it's actually a it's come back to a saturated liquid now. So in this, in this case, we're boiling. So this one's boiling. In this case, we are condensing. And so we get to a saturated liquid. And indeed, we run it into our fridge, run it through a throttle, and connect it back. And this throttle is a device we should talk about because through the process of boiling off some of the water, uh, not water, sorry, some of the fluid is vapour, you get a sharp temperature drop. And that's pretty much your fridge. So you've got four devices, right? one that's got Q in, so one drawing heat in, one that's putting work in, one that's taking heat out, and then a throttle, which is H in equals H out. That's my fridge constructed. So this is what it looks like. This doesn't have the uh, fridge drawn, but the fridge sits there. Okay. So the cold space, one should close the door on the, on the fridge. So in the cold space, it's drawing heat in. Uh, we've got the throttling valve. You'll see the arrows in this case are pointing anti-clockwise. That's quite deliberate. All the other cycles we've been looked at have gone uh, clockwise. With our TS diagram then, so doing the same thing, right, we've got an ideal compressor which takes a saturated vapour and compresses it up to state point 2. And then we need to draw heat out at constant pressure through the condenser. And so we're going to draw that back down. And we do that until it's condensed into a saturated liquid. Okay? So you see this point here is on the saturation curve and this point here is on the saturation curve. And then our throttling valve maintains enthalpy, but uh, reduces pressure down to state point four. And then, of course, we evaporate again through there. Now, I said that in a TS diagram, our Q net equals work net is the area inside the um, area inside the cycle, okay? So if you go that way, and then down, and then that way, and then up, something like that, okay? You see that if we integrate this, because that's what we're doing, the cyclic integral is what area inside means, that's a high positive number, and then this is a low negative number, okay? If we go the cycle the other way, you can see that we've got a high negative number and a low positive number. And so we find that our Q net will be um, less than one. Because in the area inside here is considered negative. Um, and so our work net is less than one, so we put work into the process and we end up, yes, with heat being drawn into the process. I think that's right. Radio. Sorry, just thinking. We don't use Reisel tables for this. Uh, we use, for this course, we use Rogers and Mayhu. There's other people who publish similar tables. This is the refrigerant 134A table, for example. Um, there's a few things to note about this table. So this does saturated values, saturation values here, and superheat values there in the same table. So in Reisel, you've got a saturation table and you've got a superheat table and a compressed liquid table. 
Here, you've got a saturation and superheat in the same table. Why don't we use, comp what, and generally you don't get compressed liquid values. Why don't you get compressed liquid values for refrigerants? As distinct from you need them for, uh, for water. They don't freeze. It's a good thought though. Right? So when we're dealing with H2O, if we're dealing with H2O at just a few atmospheres of pressure, right, or just, you know, it's a compressed liquid but only by a little bit, then we can read from saturation tables. We only need the compressed liquid tables when we're doing like a pump that compresses it to 15, 20 megapascals of pressure. Right, so really high pressures, you use a compressed liquid table at small values of compression for compressed liquid, you can just read off the saturation table. For refrigerants, unless we're doing something unusual in an organic Rankine cycle, typically we don't put them at pressures that the properties are significantly different from the saturation values. So if you've got a compressed refrigerant, you just take the HF value or the SF value, right? because it will be close enough to the fluid value. Superheat. I might do it tomorrow. I'll do a session on reading the Rogers and Mayhew tables because dealing with these in the superheated region I think is worth a little bit of treatment um, and I won't do it at the moment. Just a note that appears at the bottom of the Rogers and Mayhew tables. Right? It says these values with a little dagger are given as 201. These are different. So Rogers and Mayhew have just assumed that this enthalpy is 200 and assumed that this entropy is 1. It makes the table look nice. But you can't, if you're going to use a set of data, you have to use it all from the same table because they use different reference points. So you can't take an enthalpy value for state point 1 from Rogers and Mayhew and then an enthalpy value for state point two from Sendrel and Bowles, and then subtract them and say, well, that's the work through the compressor or what, whatever device it is that goes between those two points. Right? So they all use different reference state points, and it's worth knowing that. Um, there's a minimum possible temperature. This is more starting to get to, the, to your point about freezing. Uh, so I think this is the triple point of R134A. So you just can't get below that. And indeed, you don't, you wouldn't use the refrigerant down in this kind of range because you'll start to get a drop off in efficiency for this refrigerant. So why don't we use water as the working fluid? What would be a, a restriction of water to use as the working fluid in a freezer, for example? The water freezes, you can't, you can't get it below 0.01 um, and still have it as a, as a liquid. Right? And so we choose refrigerants and we customise our refrigerants and there's lots of them and you choose the one that is, will deal with the pressures and temperatures that you're interested in. So they have a lower and, effective, lower and upper effective limits. This one goes down to negative 103 although you wouldn't really use it there. You're more using it down to maybe negative 40, negative 30. Um, so how do you achieve cold refrigeration? Right. Two things. One is you use a different refrigerant. Uh, and you use more volatile refrigerants. So the colder you want to go, the lower the boiling temperature has to be, as a general kind of rule. And the other thing is you use cascading. And you're all very familiar with cascading. <laughs> Oh, no, but I, I hope you felt that you had what you needed to, to uh, answer the essay exam. So let's take, I know, when you see the solutions, you'll be, you'll be really sad. It's not, it's just algebra. It's, anyway. So let's take two, so just, okay, back reference last night. Um, if you're dealing with Carnot cycles, okay, and the question was, is A um, better than B? You know, what's the difference? Right, they're the same, okay? A Carnot cycle in the TS realm looks like this. 
Okay? So that would be what uh, arrangement A looks like. Arrangement B would look like that. So it would just stack two on top of one another, and they would have the same coefficient of performance. For a real fluid, and a real, in this case, vapor compression refrigeration cycle, if you wanted to extract this much heat out of the cold space, right? So heat is represented by the length of this line times the height of this area. Do you want to have five minutes to talk about the exam with one another? And I can stop talking and then I can come back. No? Good? I'll keep going? Good. All right. If you wanted to extract this much heat in a single cycle, then you'd have to compress the refrigerant that much and then bring it down to state point, in this case, seven. And your cycle would look like that, okay? If you stack up a, a cascade arrangement and you want to reduce, and you want to uh, withdraw heat, you can have one cycle going between those points and across here, it's transferring heat to the next cycle, which runs between those state points. And we actually find that the length of this line is longer, so you get an increase in refrigeration capacity, and because Q net equals W net, the area within is less, you reduce your work by all that up there. So cascade refrigeration and cascade refrigeration involving uh, different working fluids is a way of getting to low temperatures. In the video I showed, uh, the, yeah, so the video I showed where they're they getting very close to absolute zero, they ended up using helium as the working fluid. And the boiling point of helium must be very, very low. Uh, and it's useful for getting absolute zero because helium doesn't freeze at absolute zero. Yes? Does the specific heat of the refrigerant affect uh, how it cools? Does the specific heat of the refrigerant affect how it cools? Yeah. Transfer rate or? Yeah, well, like the, like the Q out, I was thinking about. Yep. It would more be the thermal conductivity than the specific heat, I think. Specific heat will affect how much flow you have to have. So you do one kilogram a second, but oh, I've found a refrigerant with a higher specific heat value, I need half a kilogram a second of flow through my system, yeah. Um, and the, the physical device of the heat exchanger would depend on thermal conductivity and some other things. It's a good question, good. So the evaporator in the cold space draws heat in, condensed in hot space rejects heat out. Uh, the flow in this case is provided by the compressor, not a pump, and the pressure difference is maintained by a throttle. So it's an open steady state, um, steady flow system, so same as the Rankine, same as the Brayton. In this case, the, the actual system is closed, uh, so not like the Otto or the diesel or the Brayton, more like the Rankine, so you've got a refrigerant that must remain encapsulated. It will evaporate if you let it go, um, and you can see that if you read the tables. And when we talk about efficiency, we talk about our thermal efficiencies in terms of uh, coefficient of performance rather than efficiency necessarily. This is just a diagrammatic representation from Reissel of the same thing, uh, showing a refrigerator on the right. If we say it's ideal, what assumptions do we make? No pressure loss in the evaporator or the condenser. You'll do pressure loss through a pipe flow in 2600 and realize that to have flow through a pipe, you need a pressure difference, but we say that it's negligible. Uh, and then we say our condenser outlet, outlet is saturated liquid. So we say at the bottom of the condenser, and I disagree with how this is drawn, um, because I don't know how they're getting the liquid state out. I think the throttle should be down here. But the basic idea is that at the bottom of the condenser, your refrigerant comes down to being a, a saturated liquid, and at the top of your evaporator, it ends up being a saturated vapor. So if you just take the result of what boils off um, at the top of your evaporator and compress that and run the cycle, then the cycle works uh, like that. Ideally, isentropic compression and H equals H across the throttle. Adiabatic except for the evaporator and the condenser. So there's no heat flowing in the throttle and so forth.
let's just look back at this table. Okay. If I have something pressured at, so this is R134A, if I have it pressured at 13 bar and it's a saturated liquid, then it has an enthalpy of 271.6. So this is these figures here, 271.6. If I run that through a throttle which drops the pressure without changing the enthalpy, because that's what we define a throttle to do, and mechanically that's what it, what it does. So say I drop the pressure from 13 bar to 2.9 bar. Right? If the enthalpy is still 271, well, is it a superheated vapor? Is it a compressed liquid? Is it a mixture? 271 lies between 200 and 398. And so we know that it's a saturated mixture of some quality. So 200 to 400, so it's about 270, so what's that? It's 35% quality, right? Or the other end? Yep, 35%. Um, so 35%, about a third of the fluid has boiled off and in the process of absorbing the energy required to boil off, it's dropped the temperature of the whole thing from 50 degrees C down to zero degrees C. So 50 degrees C is hot enough that even in Australia, you would expect some heat to be evolved into the outside environment. Right, so you compress this refrigerant down to 13 bar nominally, right? and it's hot enough now that it will give off heat. And then through your throttle, you can bring it down to zero degrees C just by running it through a throttling device. Hopefully you're familiar enough with thermo now that makes sense to you. Um, if not, the video on boiling until it freezes, or something I'll put a, a video on, uh, on teams about reducing the pressure to reduce temperature. So that's a fridge. And air conditioner is the same. Um, that's the process it works by. Any questions? Good. That's all the concept stuff. Now we do the math. So ideally, the compressor is an isentropic compressor. The condenser is isobaric, so no pressure change. Heat rejection, the throttle is isenthalpic, so no enthalpy change. And the evaporator is isobaric heat addition. For an ideal cycle, because we know that the two states are saturated, we know where state point three is and state point one is. If it was not ideal, so we had a compressor that wasn't isentropic, we could have some efficiency, like a 95% efficient compressor, for example. Um, we'll get some movement, some entropy generation through the compressor. And because it's steady state, steady flow, our, our formula for our four processes, or three of our four processes, simplifies to that. And here's what that looks like if we assume no heat through the compressor, so an adiabatic compressor, and no work in the condenser and evaporator, we get a formula for work, heat in, heat out, and now, um, obviously no enthalpy change across the throttle. I'm doing this quickly because it's the fourth time we've done it. What's the then coefficient of performance? For a refrigerator, what you want is heat to come into the system out of the cold space. And what you have to put in is work net. The only work is compressor work. So that kind of simplifies things. And so this becomes your coefficient of performance, or there's different ways of representing that. If you want to just do it in heat, you can just do it heat in and heat out. For a heat pump, so the coefficient of performance for a heat pump is either gamma equals beta plus one, or you can indeed say what we want is heat out, what we have to put in is work in the compressor, and you can go through the same process um, through the formulas. And like I said, so if we choose a pressure of, so for the um, 134A, if we choose a pressure of 2.9 bar, we get about zero degrees C. If we choose a pressure lower than that, we'll get a lower temperature. Uh, and if you want to go lower than 134A can do for you, you choose a different refrigerant. Note on reverse cycling. So this, you'd be familiar with the word 
reverse cycle from your air conditioner. So this is the idea that you can install a single unit and on hot days it will act as a refrigerator and on cold days it will act as a heat pump to draw atmospheric air in. This just shows how the same arrangement of devices, so in this case you've got, so the compressor doesn't change, the outdoor and indoor coils don't change, and the expansion valve doesn't change. I don't know why it's drawn in a different position. You could use the same expansion valve or you could use a check throttle in two different directions, but that's, that's neither here nor there. And basically what it's saying is, if after the compressor, if after the compressor, the fluid goes indoors, well then it's heating the indoor space and it's acting as a heat pump. If after the compressor, you direct the fluid to go outdoors, well then it's rejecting heat outdoors and it will act as a refrigerator. So using the same components and a simple valve, uh, you can do that and you'll see that on your air conditioning. You know, there's a hot mode, a cold mode, an auto mode, a dehumidifier, which we won't talk about until advanced thermo fluids. So that's your air conditioning system. Same thing, refrigerator. Does it need a dehumidifier? Not inside the cycle, because the cycle's only got refrigerant in it. But yes, moist air needs drying, and we won't go into it, because we assume air is dry, and air actually contains water, and ah, we just, I just, okay, who wants me to include a new topic in thermodynamics, because you haven't learned enough, right? <laughs> That's why we're not covering stoichiometry. I wanted to do it in second year, and I just couldn't fit it. Because um, I'm doing advanced thermofluids as well. I'm like, oh, I could shuffle things, I could bring it earlier. Um, anyway. <laughs> maybe, in, maybe when I have to teach subject in 10 weeks, there'll be more space in the subject for new topics. So, <laughs> did you like that? <laughs> All right. I'll just, uh, for this one, I'll show the calcs rather than do the calcs because doing the calcs takes a while, as we've seen. So I'll show you what analyzing one of these systems looks like. It's the same thing as analyzing the Rankine cycle. So a refrigerator uses a working fluid. It's got some pressures and a flow rate. Uh, we know that P2 and P3 must be the high pressure based on this cycle. We know that P1 and P4, so there's a pressure line here. This is the high pressure and this is the low pressure in the ideal. Because we're told that it's an ideal cycle, we assume isentropic compression, isenthalpic throttle, ideal evaporation and ideal con condensation. Right? So that's giving us our X values in two places and our p-value in all four places, right? Fill out a table. We've, get, we've got our pressures and our quality at two of the states, right? That lets us do the rest of our figures for state one and state three. We've got two independent intrinsic values. We look up our Rogers and Mayhew table and we find that these pressures have been very nicely tuned so avoid interpolation, you're welcome, uh, to 35 degrees and minus 20 degrees. Now we know that. We've got isentropic compression from state point one to state point two through our compressor, that's our ideal case. And we've got H3 equals H4 through the expansion valve slash throttle. So fill those values in. So it's quicker when I do it like this, right? <laughs> but you know, this takes, you, you do this by hand, you have to work them out. So now we've got two independent intrinsic values for state point two and state point four. So what would state point four be? We can calculate that, right? And so it's got a quality, interestingly enough, 35%, which was similar to the, the previous quality. So that's just interpolating that enthalpy on the minus 20 degree line. So between those two enthalpies, Putting 248 between 173 and uh, 386, the calculations are on the right hand side. So we've got our temperatures and our quality. 
we do the same thing for state point two. The calculations on the right-hand side will make more sense or less sense to you, depending on how familiar you are with the rogers mayhew tables. I'll cover that tomorrow. That's our table filled out. Now, what were the things that it wanted? Rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space. Power input to the compressor. Well, rate of heat removal, our rate of heat removal is Q cold, which is our mass flow rate times difference in enthalpies, which we can get. Work into the compressor, mass flow rate times difference in enthalpies, which we can have, so calculate those. Once we've got our values, that's relatively trivial. B, the rate of heat rejection to the environment, is the mass flow rate times the difference in enthalpies across the condenser. Or would be our QL plus our work in. So we can get that. Coefficient of performance of the refrigerator. What we want is heat to be drawn out of our cold space. What we have to put in is work into the compressor. So we get a COP of about three and a half. So that's just, I think the learning is less when you see it just flicked like that, but the PowerPoint slides will be available, I'll upload them. And you've certainly seen me do some hand calcs. I'll do some Rogers and Mayhew table stuff tomorrow. Oh, just as a side note, the Carnot efficiency would be four, the COP would be four, and so a second law efficiency, just to reintroduce this, push, push it back into your, it would be 87%. That was the vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Like I said, it's job and knock. I thought we'd, we'd finish 10 minutes ago. Um, was there any questions about vapor compression, refrigeration, anything else? I've got, yes, go. Does the refrigeration need to change phase in refrigeration in general? Vapor compression, it does. Reverse Brayton, it doesn't change phase. It stays as a gas. So for this cycle, it changes phase. You can reverse the Brayton cycle, and it doesn't. Yeah, I think I would call that like an air cooler. Yeah. All right, you're dismissed. We'll just keep going with the conversation.